Um, it's a great, great pleasure to welcome back Alan Pascuzzi, who is certainly known to many of you. Uh, he's been in Florence for a long time as both a, a history of art a researcher and teacher, but also a working practitioner, particularly of sculpture, using a lot of the traditional techniques from uh, the Renaissance period. Um, Alan has given many lectures uh, at the Business Institute over the years, and it's a pleasure as always to welcome him back to talk about bronze casting in the Renaissance. Alan, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Um, and uh, as always, uh, thank you, Simon, for, for giving me this opportunity. It's always a, a great opportunity to, to, to speak um, for the British Institute and do, and do these lectures. Um, let's, let's get right into it. Um, the name of the talk is uh, Bronze Casting in the uh, Renaissance, or Renaissance. Uh, what's the sequence of the talk? Um, there's going to be uh, four parts, or excuse me, five parts. First is an introduction, um, the commission for the virtues that I'm currently working on for Florida State University with these large uh, bronze sculptures. The second uh, part is a brief history of bronze casting, just to go backwards a little bit to see where it's come from in order to get to the Renaissance and also what's happening with the work that I, I, I'm doing right now. Uh, and then the third part is Renaissance bronze casting, bronze casting in particular. And we're going to be focusing on Giorgio Vasari, okay, the great uh, uh, art historian, who gives us some back, background information. The fourth part is um, casting works in bronze. And I'll be using Benvenuto Cellini's The Casting of the Perseus as the basis. I'll be reading from uh, 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 Cellini uh, and showing various uh, aspects of that. And then the final comments in order to wrap everything, um, wrap everything up. Um, Okay, to introduce this, um, this talk is actually based on the commission for three life-size bronze works for the Palazzo Bagnese of the Florida State uh, Study Center in Florence. And this is means of the Palazzo Bagnese, which is in uh, Via, de, Via de Neri. This was a commission that um, I got just before the beginning of the lockdown, and I basically worked all the way through it um, uh, through, the, through the lockdown. Now, the commission consisted of creating three female allegorical figures representing the Florida State University's motto. In other words, uh, these three figures would represent artes vides modes. In other words, creativity, strength, and character. And the image uh, on the lower left is actually of the emblem of the, um, uh, of the university, which is these three torches and these three models, the creativity, strength, and character. At right are the three models that are actually uh, executed um, for, the, uh, for the small works. Now, to, to go back to what this is all about, um, these go back to the Harites, this Greek ideal of these three female figures, uh, allegorical figures of brightness, joyfulness, bloom, or pleasure, chastity, beauty, or if you go to Botticelli at right, it's uh, amor, pulchritude, and, and caritas. Um, so there's many examples of these three allegorical figures, these female figures. You have the Greek at left, okay, in the center, you have the Pompeian. Uh, uh, three sort of uh, uh, um, uh, graces, and then at right you have Botticelli's. What I wanted to do is do something new, and what they asked me to do was to create three figures, female figures, that sort of looked like torches with flames on their head, okay, um, and the robes that had grooves that looked like the grooves of the torches, and they were to represent these three uh, concepts, uh, artes, vides, and modes. So artes I gave with um, all the arts, uh, a harp, a theater mask, uh, a Corinthian capital, and a painter's palette in the center. Vides has a book, and she has books underneath her feet. And at right, you have modes, which is character, uh, who's opening up and sort of blooming, so to speak. So it goes back to this sort of a Greek ideal, even this Roman ideal. And I tried to do something sort of new. So the, the commission was to do something, the, a new version of the three graces, so to speak. So taking the sculptural from the Greeks, a little bit mixing it with some of the painting uh, of the Renaissance and creating something new. And these three figures that right were the small models. And then I'll be going into that in just a second. So that, that was the commission in, in itself. Now, when you get a commission like this, speaking as an artist, not as an artist, art historian, this is a rare opportunity to work on life-size bronzes. Okay. Um, just like they did in, in the Renaissance. And as I was working on them and following in the footsteps of, of the Renaissance masters, I, I found myself using the same processes and materials in order to create these works, in order to cast them in bronze. At the moment, I'm in the middle of, of casting these figures. I just cast a, a one, of the, um, one of the sections a few days ago. 
Um, but I still have some images to show you all the process, all the, 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 the techniques leading up to the casting at right is one of the figures that I actually created, which is actually um, a Mordet. So uh, a unique uh, opportunity to recreate what they did in the Renaissance. Now, what's the objective of the talk? The attention is to explore how brown sculptures were made in the Renaissance through showing the methods that I followed to make the works. I want to reveal the artistry and also the technical skill and labor involved in making bronze sculptures. And then I also wanna reveal the close collaboration between artists and artisans uh, in order to successfully complete a work of bronze. Now, before you can read into certain things about sculptures placed in cities and stuff like that, you really have to get back to how these were made uh, and understand that to make a bronze work, it's an, an immense amount, immense amount of work. And that right are two images of the two of the figures already cast. Uh, uh, in, in bronze. Now, a brief history of a bronze casting up to the Renaissance. Bronze, as we all know, is a, an alloy of copper and tin, very percentages mixed together, fused together. Okay? Um, uh, the image up top is actually these copper and tin uh, ignits. Okay? Um, uh, the melting temperature is around 1300 degrees Celsius, about 2000 degrees. And these were actually found in a shipwreck that were discovered off the coast of, uh, of the UK in 2009. These are fused together, they're melted together, and then they create down below, the image down below, are these bronze sort of bars okay, that are then reheated and then used to make okay, the bronze sculpture. So bronze in itself is actually an alloy. Okay. Um, now bronze casting, if you want to sort of define it, is a bronze sculpture consists of a thin shell of metal representing the exact form of an original work in clay or, or on something else. Okay. You create a bronze sculpture by pouring a, a molten bronze into a negative mold. In essence, you're melting the bronze and then pouring it into a mold where it cools and you have your sculpture. Um, now, the history of, of, of bronze casting, the early bronze casting was entirely solid. The earliest example of the bronze casting that we have were essentially um, a, a solid small figure. In other words, an original was made a negative cast was made, and then that negative cast was filled with molten bronze, with melted bronze. Now, these were usually very small, and if you go to the ancient Greece, even though this uh, technique was actually perfected way back in, in what present-day Pakistan, where present-day Pakistan is, um, the figures were very small, about 40 to 50 centimeters, like a foot and a half, um, and solid, because they didn't know how to create hollow bronze works. Now, this was from like the 6th century BC up uh, 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 onward. Um, but in the 6th century BC and, and beyond that, um, there was a revolution in the sense that they began to introduce the process of a solid core with a bronze skin on top, which produced hollow works. And I'll explain this in detail in a second. So in essence, um, you have a, a fireproof core, usually of like a clay, which was then uh, covered with a wax skin of about one centimeter thick, about the width of your finger. This was then covered with a fireproof material, heated, the wax melts out, leaving a hollow space, which was then replaced with molten bronze. And if you look at the Zeus figure at right, this is how the Greeks made some of the most famous works of art. Now, let me let me illustrate this uh, very um, uh, simply. So um, essentially, they consisted of, if you look at the small image, and I'll, I'll have a, a larger image of it in just a second, you create sort of like a, a mannequin of the figure you want to create, okay, with no real detail. On top of that mannequin, you then put about a, a, a centimeter thick uh, uh, wax uh, uh, skin, it's then completely finished. You do all of your fine details, eyes, fingernails, everything. That's closed in with a, a, a fireproof core. It's heated. The wax melts out. You then pour in the melted bronze, break that core when it's cooled, and then you have your figure. Let me just show you this. So if you look at this very uh, schematic sort of um, uh, illustration, upper left, you have this mannequin, usually in clay. Okay, in the center on top, you have your complete wax figure done completely as the way you want it. Okay, up in the upper upper right, it's covered in this sort of clay, sort of fireproof core. 
you heat it, the wax melts out in the lower left. You send, uh, uh, you then pour in your molten bronze, and then after that you free it, and then you have your bronze figure. Okay? And it, it seems easy, but it's an immense amount of work. Now, this um, was used for several centuries, and then in the around the third century BC, the Greeks started to use a different technique, and that is they started to make casts of the original work, reassemble the various pieces of the cast, and then coat it with wax in order to make multiple copies. And this was actually used by the Greeks, the Etruscans, and, and, and the Romans. This is the making of a plaster cast in sections and then being able to, to reuse it. Now, what's interesting, if you look at a, a, a bronze casting in, in the Greek era, okay, and like, where do we get an idea of, of how what these bronze foundries look like? Well, we actually do have a, a foundry cup or a foundry uh, uh, helix, okay, um, from the early fifth century BC. And this gives us some really in, interesting insight on how the Greeks did it. Okay, and eventually how they even did it in the Renaissance. Now, if you look very carefully at this uh, painted cup, okay, at the left you have this big sort of tube, that's the uh, furnace, you have people working in the furnace. Off to the right you have like hands and feet and hammers, and there's another guy off to the other right who's actually hammering a bronze figure a, as well, okay? And this is a, a bronze foundry of like the, you know, the fifth century BC. On the other end of it, there's figures working on a large figure in wax. Okay, they're actually scrapers. You can see the scrapers are actually working on this thing. There are actually other people sort of watching them as well. So this gives us a good idea of, of what it looked like in a bronze foundry in this, in this time period. Now, what they produced were images like this, the, the Riachi bronzes that we all know were found in 1972 off the coast of Reggio Calabria, and then they were actually brought to Florence and, and restored here in Florence. And these are some of the most exquisite pieces of a bronze work ever made. There must have been thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces. If you look at these things, these are uh, brilliant works of art. Okay, they're probably from two different artists. Okay, um, uh, and if you look at some of these, I have a close-up of these. Okay, um, this uh, exemplifies what the Greeks w really were shooting for. Okay, well-made. And in the Greek era, um, uh, artists were called technites. Okay. And essentially what they were looking for was doing something that was well-made. And that concept of making something perfect um, is captured, uh, you could even see it even the, in the people who make bronzes even today, okay? They don't really care when they, when they cast bronze what the artist is all about. What they care about is doing it perfectly. And you see this in the bronze works of the Greek era, and you even see this today as well. So it's something that's carried on through the centuries. The concept of well-made, this technical ability. Now, really quickly, um, the Etruscans knew the bronze casting technique. In fact, I, I know bronze casters who, who looked at this and said, this is extremely fine bronze. It's less than one centimeter thick. Exquisite bronze casting technique. And this is done with no modern sort of um, uh, machines. The Etruscans were brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, bronze casters. Um, Greek and Roman bronze casters, Romans probably learned from the Greeks, like this image at right of the Aringatore in the Museo Archeologico in, in, uh, in Florence. And if you look at it as a whole, the Greek and Roman bronze casting techniques, okay, which flourished, okay, for centuries, were almost completely lost in the Middle Ages, um, and essentially reduced to uh, simple casting methods. That and it was it survived thanks to bell casters in certain cases. So when the Renaissance happens, there's sort of a revival of this, and this brings us to Renaissance bronze casting, bronze casting, the third section. Um, the bronze casting methods uh, were gradually rediscovered in the Renaissance, as they said. Um, many Renaissance sculptors relied on the technical knowledge of bell casters. These were the only individuals who had the, if, if you look at the image at right, um, uh, the, 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 the studios, uh, the bottega, I should say, or the materials, the know-how, the technical know-how, the furnaces, in order to create these large works that the Renaissance needed, okay, from like 1400 on. Now, Renaissance sculptors used both of the techniques that I explained, you know, the, the, the solid core with the wax skin, and then uh, the other technique of sort of making casts and then reproducing it uh, over and over again. So they actually used both, uh, both of these things that uh, the Greeks had, had used. If you look at Renaissance sculptors and bronze casting in general, not all Renaissance, Italian Renaissance sculptors knew the founder's craft. Um, Donatello, Michelangelo had little experience in bronze casting. Michelangelo, we know, only did two works in it. Um, Donatello had many, um, but Donatello relied on bell casters. We know, however, that some of them were pretty good. 
Ghiberti, Polaiuolo, Bedrocchio, Cellini, Giambologna were all expert captors and knowledgeable of the technical aspects. In certain cases, Cellini was doing it literally where he lived. And if you look at this image at right of Bedrocchio's Christ in, uh, in St. Thomas, it's actually one of the most brilliant bronze uh, pieces of, of the Renaissance. But the one common denominator is that all of them relied on skilled assistance. Um, you can't do a bronze work by yourself. You need people who are experts in their craft. And I think this is one of the main sort of concepts that I want to uh, relate to this. Now, if you get into the Renaissance, we could spend hours looking at all these, but Ghiberti, the bronze door, the gates of paradise, he spends 25 years on the first set, 25 years on the second set. These are, uh, even Michelangelo called them the gates of paradise. They're, they're perfectly uh, crafted, okay, technically perfect. Donatello's David, obviously. Donatello's one of the first to use that piecing method. In fact, this, if you look at it very carefully, you can see him piecing various things together. There's also some interesting sort of uh, uh, mistakes, quote, uh, so to speak. If you look at it very carefully, if you look behind it uh, uh, on, the, on the Goliath's head, there's some interesting sort of patchwork, which is extremely interesting. Um, John Bologna's Mercury, which is the quintessential sort of piece of expert bronze casting, the the figure that's resting on the on the breath of Zephyr. Okay, the whole figure is perfectly balanced. Okay, with that finger that's pointing upward as well. Um, and then Cellini's Perseus, which is in right in Piazza Signoria, uh, supposedly cast in one piece or probably with a couple little pieces uh, added on to it. Uh, exquisite work. Um, and I'll be going into specifically how this was cast in Cellini's own account of it. So. Um, you can see that the better the uh, knowledge of bronze casting by the artist, the better the works came out in certain cases. Now, Renaissance bronze casting, it's easy to give a broad description of bronze casting. Uh, and many art historians wax eloquent on it. Um, but how did the Renaissance masters cast their most famous works in bronze? How did they create their works from the beginning? What methods did they use? What difficulties did they encounter? And these are the same things that I've encountered, and this is why I'm, I, I, I want to talk about this. Um, now, what are our sources? The primary sources on Renaissance bronze casting, there's about two or three. The first one is actually Vasari. The first main source is his art treatise on technique, which goes through painting and everything, and I would heavily suggest you to read through it. It's brilliant. Um, he describes the processes used to create a work in bronze. Um, now, what I'm going to do and this is sort of sort of new for me, um, but excuse me, through images of my work on the bronze allegorical figures that, that that I'm doing and I've done, I will illustrate Vasari's description step by step. So I'm going to use a primary source from the Renaissance, and I'm going to illustrate it with what I've done in the present day. Okay? And let's let's just jump into this. Um, Vasari, step one. The model, and this is Vasari writing in uh, his treatise. And you write, sculptors are accustomed to make what is called a model for it, in other words, the work, in clay or wax or plaster, because they can exhibit in it the attitude and proportion of the figure that they wish to make, endeavoring to adapt themselves to the height and breadth of their statue. Now, in the lower left, you have the three virtues, but on the right, you have one of the large versions of the clay version of Okay, Vides. Okay, this is about 40 centimeters high. And this is what he's talking about. You have to do the model. Now, the model usually is after doing a number of drawings. And these are some of the drawings I did from life. Uh, these are sculptor's drawings. They're not figure drawings. I'm trying to understand every angle. In fact, I did a, a, a drawing from every angle, front, side, three-quarter view. Um, uh, in order to understand the anatomy, get your proportions down, measurements. So even to get to the model, there's an immense amount of work just to get there. And these are um, for the two, uh, two of the figures. Step two, after you get your model, what does Vasari say? And he states, to make the figure, the large sculpture, support itself, it may have underneath an armature, either of wood or iron wires, according to the pleasure of the artist. And that right is the sort of uh, is the armature that I created for uh, a Vita. And this is actually in... Uh, 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 iron, okay. Uh, it has to withstand and sustain a number of uh, pounds of uh, clay, and then you begin to add wood to it. I prefer wood. I don't like wood. I don't like the, the sort of modern sort of materials that sometimes people use. I like to the, the, the keep it organic. Okay, you're building up the figure, the basis of the figure, okay, keeping everything exactly uh, as it is, the same position. 
And this is what he says. This is what Vasari says. The bones of the figure, in other words, the armature, are made and placed in the necessary pose after the pattern of the small model. So you're always walk, working from your small model. So small model is on the left of mine, and on the right is the large figure. They're trying to be as accurate as possible because you've worked everything out. And then what does Vasari state? Little by little, always adding material with judgment and manipulation, the artist impresses the clay by means of tools made of bone, iron, or wood. And again, putting on more, he alters and refines till with the fingers, the utmost finish is given to the model. So at right, we see the initial stages of putting on the clay, of actually dressing it, okay? sort of putting on the, uh, the clay uh, um, uh, on top in order to begin to work on the, the anatomy. Okay, and then what does Vasari continue to say? And from beginning to the end of the process of covering it with clay, the figure is formed in the nude. And at right, this is about a, after a week or so of, of working on it, um, getting the anatomy sort of uh, proportional. And then I'll go on. This is uh, another version. Okay, still working on the anatomy. I, uh, the head, hands, and, and feet I, I do separately. And then this is about uh, about a, after a week or so, two weeks or so, maybe 10 days, um, uh, the anatomy is there, okay, pretty much set. Um, always keeping in mind the drawing, the anatomy that you worked out from the life's drawing, so you're always trying to keep things as close as possible to your original work, okay, you don't want to stray too much, um, you don't want to trust your eye, you're constantly measuring, okay, so this is a drawing at left, and the right is the absolute um, sort of uh, uh, the mood. Uh, sort of a clay. Also doing the back, making sure the back is just as accurate as the front. I, I like that Greek ideal of the Greeks actually work more on the back than the front of the figures in certain cases. Remember, these are figures in the round. They have to be perfect all the way around. So you're working on things. Again, this is also from uh, the anatomy that you established in your in your drawing. Okay, making sure the scapula, okay, the trapezius, okay, the latissimus dorsi, uh, they're all uh, extremely sort of accurate. And then the heads, um, you have to do the heads separately. You can't do them on top of the, of the work. So essentially what you have to do is uh, do the head separately. These are uh, our sets of that left and, and more this is that, that right. Okay, and then you work on these uh, almost as portraits, okay, uh, using the lights in order to make them uh, completely sort of uh, anatomically correct and lifelike. Okay, you have to concentrate on these things uh, separately. And then once the head is done, you attach it to the, the, the figure, okay, and this is the, the head of uh, of Venus, okay, done from life, attached, and then you work on the hair, and there's even there's even a section on hair that was already stated, but I didn't want to didn't want to to go into too much detail. Um, what I did notice is that when I looked at the bronze figure of the of the of the Riachi bronzes, that the, the grooves in the hair of the Riachi bronzes, I realized were probably done by one of these groove tools that Vasari uh, uh, had mentioned. Um, that gets produced perfectly in bronze, so that works perfectly. So I tried to be as uh, Riachi-like as possible with the, um, with the hair of uh, the Vita, the curls and the hair of the Riachi bronze, which I tried to uh, recreate. And then the feet, you're working on the, the toes uh, and the, the cuticles, just like the, the image of the feet that were in the, the bronze boundary cup uh, 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 that I showed you before the Greek um, uh, painted uh, vase. Okay, and then you have the figure. And the figure is complete, head, hands, feet, okay, completely in nude. You have to do it in nude in order to understand the anatomy. What does Vasari say? Draping the nude model. This is what this is what Vasari actually states. This completed, if the artist desires afterwards to clothe it with thin drapery, he then takes fine cloth and wets it and then covers it over with clay, not liquid, but of the consistency of rather thick mud that should be not made, and arranges it around the figure in such folds and creases as the mind suggests. This, when dry, becomes hardened and continues to keep the fold. So what does that mean? You dress the figure by putting on a wet clay onto real cloth and draping it. And this is the secret of the Renaissance in certain cases, how they get those draperies. You can't make up folds. You have to do them. They have to be real folds. They have to hang on the body. And this is, this is important because this had to be the grooves of the, uh, of the, um, of the torches of the, of, the, of the motto. And then this is the bottom section. And then the top section, and the figure is essentially complete. Okay, using this cloth that's been sort of uh, uh, covered with clay, and you drape it on. So this is the complete figure of Vitas. The same um, uh, was done from the back, and this is actually one of the back, one of the ties of the belt. Okay, and this is what you get. You get these realistic-looking sort of drape, uh, drapery, which if you look at Renaissance 
um, uh, sculptures exactly. It's exactly the same sort of uh, same effect. So the completed figure, um, the feet, the books, okay, the details are worked out as well, and the drapery has to sort of flow over these. So you need to have something that's uh, supple. And the same thing I used for the other figures. I didn't want to go into all of them. At left is the nude sort of artes, the lower half, okay, the draped lower half, and then the draped upper half. Uh, uh, as well. And this is how you actually do the, the, the great figures. Okay? As, as, as I now, from here, then we start into the casting. And this is where we move into the, the bronze casting process. When this, which they call the large model, is finished and brought to the point of perfection, they then begin with plaster that will set to cover over it piece by piece, making the pieces correspond to the roots of the model. What does he mean? You're making a negative mold and making a, a negative cast. Now, before they did it in, in plaster of Paris and gesso, um, and they did it, as he said, they molded part by part, till from piece to piece the figure grows, the head, the arms, the body, and the legs, to the last detail in such a manner that the concave of the statue, that is the hollow mold, comes to be imprinted on the inner surface with all the parts and with a very minutest marking, which is the model. So what are you doing? You're making a negative cast. That right is an image of what they use today is a, a, a liquid silicone. To coat it, okay, it's very sort of runny, but then it hardens through a harder gum. This enters into all of the detail. You then cover it with another type of silicone, which is actually encased, uh, which then hardens to a, a hard gum. And then from here, you have to do the counter mold. And the images that I'm showing you now are the counter molds of the one red head, okay. Um, these are the hard sort of casings on top of the figure, just like Vasari said, um, because these are going to give the back into the silicone when you cut them all uh, away from pieces. And again, this is an example of one of them removed. Okay. So just like what was done in the, the Renaissance in, in certain cases. And this is a lower section of one of the one of the legs. So you basically cover it with silicone, cover it with a, a hard shell of this um uh, of this casing and then take it away. To give you an example of when you pull away, what happens is you have this negative cast of the figure. And that's exactly what what happened in the Renaissance, but they did essentially, they did it with um, a gesso. And when you're looking down at it, this is exactly what Vasari said, all the minutest details are in the inside of this mold. You have the negative, and this is going to serve for, in order to do, okay, the wax positive, in order to do the, uh, the, the casting of bronze. So this is an essence, okay, this is just the, um, one of the first and most important um, steps in order to get things cast in bronze. Okay, preparation for the casting in bronze, the wax copy. Okay, so we've got our original, we go for the wax copy. Um, what does Vasari say? To, returning now to the pieces of the hollow mold, these are lined with yellow wax. The wax is poured into the two halves of the mold, uh, uh, made up of the hollow pieces in such a manner as causes the wax to come thin according to the worker's idea of the cast. The pieces are joined and fitted and grafted together. Now, what does he mean? In that empty mold that I showed you, the, in, at right, you then begin to enter in or pour in wax. Um, the, the counter mold, the counter forms are used to make the wax copy. When it cools, it's very hard, and you have the next image. You have your wax image of the figure you've just done. Now, this begins a process that is extremely uh, uh, tedious, the wax copy. And what does Vasari say? This completed, in other words, the wax copy, they proceed to remove all of the superfluous wax that has overflowed onto the interstices of the pieces and bring it as well as possible to that finished excellence and perfection which one desires in the bronze cast. The craftsman, in other words, the artist or the craftsman in certain cases, considers diligently if the wax has any deficiency, can proceed to repair it and fill up again, putting on more or taking away where necessary. And this begins the true process of actually making a bronze work, touching up in wax. Now, at right, um, uh, what you can see is that some of the touch-ups. Now, what do I mean by this? When the wax cools to form the positive cast, okay, um, you get the exact copy of it, you have to then refine the wax and retouch it with red jeweler's wax. So everywhere you see that red sort of uh, uh, those spots, that's where I have to retouch it with red jeweler's wax, which is actually a little, um, a little more, uh, it warms up a little, a little quicker in your hand. It's easier to retouch a bronze figure that you're going to make while it's in the wax state than in the bronze state. So anything you want to change, you want to do it now. So that's why this is the most important aspect of the whole bronze casting process, retouching that wax 
copy because that is eventually going to be Captain Brown. Some of the images that I have, these are some of the lower um, parts of some of the figures you can see on either side, other parts of them. Okay, and these have yet to be retouched. Okay, um, uh, on this side, you can actually see, okay, basically the same, the same thing. Okay, some they're damaged a little bit. Uh, this is the lower part of Vitas. Okay, there's a lot to do on this one. So this was, after you make the wax uh, positive, you have to keep on sort of touching it up. And this is Artis. All those red areas are where I actually had to retouch it. Okay, very long, tedious work, um, uh, especially the eyes, okay, to make sure everything is, is perfect. And this is uh, Vitas. I had to reattach the head. Okay, this had to be retouched. Okay, and also the top of the flame. Uh, I actually liked it in the in the wax uh, process. So for every bronze sculpture you see in in the city of Florence, the Renaissance work, it, it started like this in certain cases. Uh, and what you see at left is the clay version. At right is the wax version. And it's usually very it's perfect. I mean, and in fact, you can even bring it up to higher perfection in the wax form. So the clay, after you do that, is actually just you don't really need it anymore because you're working on the wax form, okay? And this is the same head with the crown. All these figures will have these little crowns uh, on their heads um, as well. This is Vetus. Now, what do you use? These are the tools that you use, very much like the ones that you saw in the um, in the calyx, uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the painted uh, uh, Greek uh, sort of a, a, a cup, okay? It's, uh, it's smelly, you got a lot of wax usually sticking all over the place, okay? Uh, it's very difficult in the summer, but these are the tools that you use. This was the workshop uh, uh, sort of spot where I was working. And this is how you actually retouch it. Okay? It's sort of very tedious, very careful sort of work. Okay. And this is Mores. Uh, this was uh, not a lot to do on this one. This came out pretty, pretty well. Okay. A little touch up from the eye and some of the, the garments as well. So you, you do your complete sort of retouching at this state. Okay. And then you have some of the pieces like the feet. Some of the hearts, these are some of the things of, of other of other the figures um, in order to uh, touch up everything. And you get a complete quality control on everything. I did a lot of the, the toenails, okay, the uh, pedicures and all the figures. Okay, now, you want to get ready for the actual casting bronze. What's the next step? In order to cast these wax figures in bronze, rods made of wax are then applied to the wax copy in a network to cover the entire surface. When a wax copy is covered with fire resistant materials and heated, the wax rods will melt and create hollow tubes for the distribution of molten bronze to reach the entire area of the sculpture and also to allow air to run out. Now, each rod touching the surface of the sculpture covers about 10 square centimeters of the surface area. So you have to have exact calculations of where these touch and what area they're going to cover. And you have to make sure that those rods cover the entire figure. Now you can see some of these really quickly. If you go to the backside of the Verrocchio Christ in St. Thomas, you can actually see some of them. I wanted to get better images, but I couldn't get into the Orphan Michaelic. If you look at very closely, you can still see some of these rods and some of the of the bronze casting on the backside of these figures. Uh, unfortunately, you really can't see it in some of these images that I, that I have. Okay, but what you're trying to do is cover the entire figure, and this is where the technique is. This is the skill of the artisan that has to know where the bronze is eventually going to flow. Now, these wax runners have to converge at the top where the bronze will be poured in, okay, when they become tubes, so that when the bronze gets poured in, all of them are going to, the, 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 the bronze is going to flow down, okay, in this network and replace the space left by the wax, okay? So you have something like this uh, with all of these tubes that are all around the figure to make sure that, okay, this is completely covered up with, Okay, these rods, which will then become tubes. Okay, now from here, this wax figure with all these runners are then encased in a fireproof sort of envelope. Usually it's like a plaster of Paris with some earth. Okay, entirely encased. Okay, um, and then this is getting ready for the bronze casting process. This is called the fire resistant envelope. And this is actually the one you can even see my name on the top. Okay, of the figure that's being ready for the casting. Okay, now let's get to the casting in bronze. This is sort of like the, the climax of everything. Um, Benvenuto Cellini, this is a, 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 a section four, uh, in bronze casting. In Cellini's autobiography, he describes the casting of the, of the perfume. 
uh, which is perhaps one of the most famous works. It's right in Piazza Signoria. Okay. Um, Cellini actually used the clay core wax method. In other words, the, the uh, Cellini's Perseus was actually has that clay core, the wax on top of it. He finished the wax and then was cast. Okay. In fact, if you look in the Bargello, there's actually some of the test pieces that he did for the Perseus. So he did many models, okay, like I did for, for my works. And then he did the work, okay, put the wax on it, okay, finished it up and then, and then cast it. So he used that second, uh, excuse me, the, the old uh, um, sort of technique that the Greeks actually used. Now, I have to take a parenthetical sort of a detour. I went to go see where, okay, uh, Cellini actually cast his work. And last Friday, I got on my bike and I went to Vida La Pergola and I went up and down and I found, it's at number 59, in Vida La Pergola, there's a little plaque that says the house where Benvenuto Cellini, okay, uh, formed and, and cast his Perseus. But right at that moment when I was taking the picture, there was some actually entering into the house and I said, excuse me, sir, you live in the house where Perseus was cast. And he turns around and said, well, that's what the general story is. And I said, excuse me? He said, well, in reality, Cellini probably lived at 57. But there's another entrance at, at, in Via Lauda, which is around the corner, and this whole area is probably a big, huge bronze foundry. And then I said, well, isn't it true that he cast it in the garden? He said, well, that's not really true either, because I found where he actually cast it. And I was like, you got to tell me the story. And essentially, he said that he was uncovering some things in his basement. He found a big, huge beam with these hooks. That's exactly what you need in order to move these big things around. And he said, I think that... Cellini was actually casting in where my basement was, which probably wasn't a basement. It was probably like, you know, the big bronze pond. So, and I said, well, don't you, you should tell people this. And he said, oh, what do they care? And I said, well, so there's a little bit of controversy over where the Cellini actually cast this thing. But this is generally what they say. This is where the plaque is. Now, Cellini's description of bronze casting. Cellini's description is one of the most colorful stories in his autobiography. And he tells how this was cast. In fact, it's actually one of the best sort of uh, uh, art historical renditions of, uh, of any technique. And I understand why he cast it like that, uh, uh, literally and figuratively. He was trying to get, he was trying to show something about the bronze casting technique. He essentially recounts how his Perseus was almost ruined while casting and how he works. And I'll get into this in a second. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use his description as a basis to describe the casting process of the bronze figures. Okay. So what I found is that reading Cellini was exactly what was happening when I was actually casting my own without the drama, so to speak. Now, let's just dive right into this. So I'll be reading from Cellini and then illustrating what he was saying or telling using my own bronze figures. And this is what he says, abandoned thus to my own resources, extremely melodramatic. I took new courage and banished the sad thoughts which kept recurring to my mind, making me often weep bitter tears of repentance for having left France. For though I did so only to revisit Florence, my sweet birthplace, according, accordingly, I strengthened my heart and with all the forces of my body and my purse, employing what little money still remained to me, I set to work. And that I can sort of um, uh, uh, understand what he was saying with that. Okay, you set to work. Uh, the concept is doing the art. Now, what did he say? I began to draw the wax out by means of a slow fire. In other words, he's already done the Perseus, okay, and he has to, he has to do the melting of the, of the wax. I, this melted and, and issued through numerous air vents I had made. For the more there are of these, the better would, the mold would fill. When I had finished drawing of the wax, I constructed a funnel-shaped furnace all around the model of my Perseus. It was built with bricks, so interlaced, the one above the other, that numerous apertures were left for the fire to impale it. Then I began to lay on wood by the degrees and kept it burning two days, two whole days and nights. And what are you saying? He has it in this sort of mold and he has to burn out the wax. Now, at right is the, the sort of the envelope that I have for my figures. And um, this other image at left, this is where the, um, uh, where the figure is inside. At right is this huge furnace. Now this, for my works, I actually put the work in there for 10 days. It's heated and the wax begins to run out. It takes 10 days, uh, uh, to in two days. So this is what he was talking about, to draw out the wax. You have to melt out the wax to leave those um, hollow sort of tubes. And then this is what he says. At length, when all the wax was gone and the mold was well baked, I set to work at digging the pit in which to sink it. This I performed with scrupulous regard to all the rules of art. I next lowered it gently down into the very bottom of the furnace, and had it firmly placed with every possible precaution for its safety. When this delicate operation was accomplished, I began to bank it up with earth I had excavated, 
And ever as the earth grew higher, it introduced its proper air vents, which were very, which were little tubes of earthenware, such as folks use for drains and such like purposes. Now, at right, this is the pit that he's talking about. Okay? And let me just advance one more. At left, this is the pit that he's talking about. You have to lower this big, huge envelope, okay, into a pit because you want to pour down lower. At right, you can see there's a, a central sort of hole that's where you're going to pour the, the bronze. And there's these little holes around it, in other words, for the air to come out. Now, um, when you do this, you have to follow very strict rules. You have to make sure that there's sand around it, okay? Um, and you have to make sure that no dirt gets in those holes, okay? And that's what he was saying, these scrupulous sort of rules of the trade, okay? And when you do this, you need to be, you need to follow these uh, rules. Otherwise, things can go extremely wrong. The furnace, preparing the, the bronze in the furnace. And this is what Cellini says. I next turned to my furnace, which, which I had filled with numerous pigs of copper and other bronze stuff. The pieces were piled according to the laws of art, that is to say, so resting one upon the other that the flames could play free, uh, freely through them in order that the metal might heat and liquefy the, the sooner or the sooner. Down below, it, at left is the bronze sort of bars, and right is the furnace. And now we have all these. Uh, sort of a gas uh, sort of furnace that can get up extremely hot, okay? But before, they had to heat them with just wood. And this is what Cellini says. At last, I called out heartily to set the furnace going. The logs of pine were heaped in, and what with the unctuous resin of the wood and the good draught I had given, my furnace worked so well that I was obliged to rush from side to side to keep it going. The labor was more than I could stand, yet I forced myself to strain every nerve and muscle. So that right is the furnace that's heating up, and if I can go into this really quickly, the furnace at left is the modern one. The one at right is the one I showed you. And if you look very carefully, there isn't too much in the design, okay, that's actually changed from the 5th century BC, uh, which is extremely interesting. So if you look at the furnace at left, okay, which is the modern one next to the ancient one, you can, you can imagine that bronze casting, the technology hasn't really changed. Okay, before they heated these things up with wood, but, we, uh, are, but now they do it with different uh, means. But it's, in essence, it's basically the same. And Cellini goes on about the workers. And this is where it gets more melodramatic. Exerting myself beyond even the measure of my powerful constitution, I could at last bear up no longer. And a sudden fever of the utmost possible intensity attacked me. I felt absolutely obliged to go and fling myself upon my bed. I turned to my assistants, about ten or more in all, what with master founders, hand workers, country fellows and my own special journeyman, among whom was Bernardino Manelli of, of Mugello, my apprentice for several years. To him in particular I spoke, look, my dear Bernardino, that you observe the rules which I have taught you, do your best with all dispatch, or the metal will soon be fused. You cannot go wrong. And the workers that write, um, it's a tight group of workers when you, when you cast bronze. Everyone knows what they're doing, so he's recounting this concept of this uh, of this really tight knit team, okay, and they should know what they what they need to do. Now, if you're looking at the preparing of the bronze, I have these two images. This is the the, um, the crucible at left, okay, before it's heated. That right is when they're heating it. They have to heat this up to the same temperature, a little bit hotter than the bronze, because there's a molten bronze in this, and it's not hot enough; it could actually explode. So these workers know what they're doing. Okay, everyone has a job, and these are the workers that were heating up this crucible ready uh, ready it for uh, the bronze itself and the casting drama and this is what Cellini says no sooner had i got to bed than i ordered my serving serving mates to carry food and wine for all the men into the workshop at the same time i cried i shall not be alive tomorrow they tried to encourage me arguing that my illness would pass over since it came from excessive fatigue and this way i spent two hours battling with the fever which steadily increased and calling out continually, I feel that I am dying. I'm making a little bit mentally dramatic, but casting in bronze is, is a bit dramatic as well. The heating of the bronze, and let's let's go on with this. Um, what happens? Disaster happens. Oh, Benvenuto, your statue is spoiled, and there is no hope whatever of saving it. Jumping from my bed, I seized my clothes and began to dress. I went immediately to inspect the furnace and found that the metal was all curdled, in other words, hardened. An, an accident, which we expressed by being caked. I dealt two of uh, the hands to cross the road and fetch from the house of the butcher Capretta a load of young oak wood, which had lain dry for a year. So the, the bronze is curdled, and I noticed that if, if it doesn't heat uh, um, uh, correctly, okay, it can get hard. You have to keep the heat going. 
Okay. Now remember, the bronze is heated about 1300 degrees Celsius, and you have to constantly check it. You have to make sure that it's flowing. If it doesn't flow, you can't do the you can't do the pour. So you have to constantly check. You have to constantly check it. Um, and this is where we get into Vulcan's Forge, and this is what Cellini says. Now, oak wood of that kind heats more powerfully than any other sort of tree. And for this reason, where a slow fire is wanted, older or pine is preferred. Accordingly, when the logs took fire, oh, how the cake began to stir beneath that awful heat to glow and sparkle in a blaze. Exactly what you see at right uh, of the furnace that I took these pictures about, about a week ago. I then ordered half a pig of pewter to be brought, which weighed about 60 pounds, and flung it into the middle of the cake inside the furnace. By this means, and the, by piling on wood and stirring now with pokers and now with iron rods, the curdled mass rapidly began to liquefy. So the, the bronze begins to go. And I even talked to some old, um, old artisans about why oak wood, because it's more dense. It burns okay, with more intense heat. If you do bronze casting, you have to have oak wood. Now, molten bronze poured into the crucible. These two images show the very delicate um, sort of uh, operation of in the large furnace pouring the bronze into the handheld crucible. At this, I was about maybe 10, 15 away, 15, 15 feet away. It's extremely hot. You have to be very careful. You don't want to drop this. Okay. And that's when you can see that the bronze is now molten, uh, like liquid, okay, absolute liquid. And that's what you want. That's what Cellini was giving for. That's what everything. Um, uh, that's why he, he ran out of bed. Now he also states, says that you know the roof caught fire and things exploded, but his, his uh, uh, objective was to cast his figure, and this is what he says as he's casting. Everyone could now perceive that my bronze was in most perfect liquefaction, and my mold was filling. Whereupon they all, with heartiness and happy cheer, assisted and obeyed my bidding, while I now here, now there, gave orders. Helped with my own hands and cried aloud, God, thou that by invisible power didst rise from the dead and in thy glory didst ascend to heaven. Even thus in a moment my mold was filled and seeing my work finished, I fell upon my knees and with all my heart gave thanks to God. Now I didn't do that when I saw these things in past, but um, this is what he's talking about. It's a very dangerous process. Okay, things can go wrong. And this is the point of the mold right here. Okay, and you, when brown spatters it, Spatters liquid, but then when it heats to the ground, it actually is already hardened. You don't want one of those things to go through you, and that's why they're all uh, protecting. So this is pouring in the mold, okay? And when it fills, the uh, the mold, uh, the bronze, liquid bronze comes out, and you can feel the hot air being pressed out as well. And that's when you know that every, all the work you've done, from the, the, the clay up to the wax, is gone uh, uh, well, and that your figure should be okay, done. Now, what happens? You have to wait about 12 hours, and then you lift out this huge sort of envelope, and you have to break it free. And this is the first time that you actually see if your work was cast correctly. Now, at left is what you have to break. At right is when you break it free. You have the figure in bronze with all of those rods that are now solid bronze. And if you look at these two images, uh, everything worked perfectly. All those uh, uh, wax rods, which were melted, became tubes have now all been filled with bronze and have uh, filled the, the figure perfectly, okay? Distributed the bronze perfectly. And this is what you want. These now have to be cut and the figure has to be shaped. Now, remember, at left is what you did with the wax, okay? Then you encased it, melted it. At right is what you get, okay? And this is where the real work begins, the real finishing work as well. And this is when you have the chasing and the cutting of the, of the runners. So at left, you have the figure uh, with all the runners on it, at right, being cut off, okay? And then finally, these two images of the same the same uh, uh, legs uh, with the runners being cut, and at right, being totally uh, totally chased, uh, in other words, and, and, and clean. Now, um, these two figures, like I said, the figures aren't complete, but these are the two uh, figures, uh, the upper part of the, the two, um, uh, Mortis and Vitas, okay? This is Vitas with the, the flame soldered on. This still has to be um, sort of polished up and given the patina. Okay, this is uh, Modis as well. Still has to be filled up, soldered in little things here and there. Okay, and then the thickness of the bronze, if you look inside, is about a finger stick. Okay, it's about one centimeter, which is pretty good. Okay, uh, all the way around the, the figure. And then the other uh, uh, details, the arms, the hands that I have to solder on still, the harp, the uh, mask, the theater mask, all of these have been cleaned, okay, chased, and these now have to be soldered on, which uh, I haven't 
Yeah. So really quickly, at left you have the uh, a clay version, the wax version in the center, and then the bronze version. Okay. Immense amount of work just to get to that. And the same thing with mortis, okay, the clay, the wax, and also uh, the bronze uh, as well. Okay, final comments. Um, the figures, as I said, have yet to be assembled. They have to be placed in the palace, but um, uh, they're on that again state. The casting process is in casting even today, a bronze casting process is highly involved, highly technical. Um, artists have to rely on skilled artisans. And, and even Cellini knew this, he even said that you rely on your artisans, but you also have to check them as well. What's interesting is that when you look at a bronze work, you have to realize that it's a collaboration between the creativity of the artist and the technical skills of the artisans as well, and this intertwining of, of, of both. Ironically, it's the skilled artisans who made these works, but in certain cases, they're, they're forgotten in time. We don't know most of the names. Cellini actually mention, mentions them, I think, as a sort of a means of respect. But if you look at bronze works, what's interesting is that they're conceived with this inspiration of the artist, you can amuse. They're born with fire, in other words, the, the, the casting of them with the molten bronze, and finished with the dedication to craftsmanship. Um, and that's what's interesting, is that artist and artisanship in order to make something, I think, technically perfect. Thank you. Thank you for coming out uh, tonight. Well, thank you also, uh, Alan. And maybe you'll now unshare so that we can sure. have the thumbnails up. And um, for those uh, who want to reveal yourselves, please um, put your video on. Um, and as normal, we will um, invite people to ask questions, make comments. And there's two ways to do that. You can either put something up in the chat, which either Alan or I will read out, uh, or if you want to talk to us, um, just unmute yourself and speak. And then we'll, we'll hear you. Um, so I was thinking what to say, uh, we've got a comment from Vanessa Hall-Smith. It's a great lecture. So sadly, I have to leave, so I can't stay. I wanted to ask you about anxiety levels throughout the process. Well, how anxious are you when you're doing these high-risk things? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I wasn't as dramatic as Cellini, that's for sure. Um, uh, um, yeah, no, I, I think what was interesting about Cellini, he was doing it literally in his own backyard. I mean, there were there were bronze casting foundries, but he was doing everything within his own, his own home. Um, it was sort of like, uh, you know, a, a home brewery type of thing. Um, uh, the, the anxiety, yes, spe specifically when you're doing the, 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 the casting process, uh, specifically with the bronze, because you, you really don't know if, if, if there's a blockage and you only find out until after it's all done, when you break it, when you break it free. So um, until you break it free, that's the only indication whether it's all done correctly or not. So there's that, that split second of, okay, it's going to come out right or not. Yeah, a little bit of anxiety. It's fascinating. Yeah, it occurred to me also that it, uh, you said it takes an incredible amount of time. You can see that. Uh, it's also got to be pretty damn expensive to make a, a life-size bronze. It, it is. In fact, that's, um, that's one of the reasons why bronze is about 10 times more expensive than marble sculptures. In fact, anytime you see a bronze work in the Renaissance, it meant that someone had the money in order to, to pay for it. Um, not mm. just the bronze itself, but um, all the materials that you need, the wood, um, uh, uh, mm. the, the furnace. I mean, these are, it takes an immense amount of, of, of machinery um, uh, to make yeah. a, a bronze work. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so relatively speaking, the material cost of marble is much less because it's just a big block, which and then a guy with a chisel and hammer. It can, <laughs> can do it, time. yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, the main cost of marble work is actually just transporting the marble. You can buy a, a yeah. marble block for about one square meters for 700 euros, 800, but it takes about 1,500 to get it from the mountain back to yeah. your, yeah. your studio. Yeah. Your studio. Yeah. Interesting. So Jody's asking a question. Uh, okay. I don't know, it's jumping up and down. Um, I just, before that, Michael Thompson Glover is saying, how are the sections joined? And um, Jody said, said, how long did it take to complete this commission, Alan? Okay, the, the sections, the, if you're talking about the bronze section, the bronze sections are actually soldered together. Um, uh, in other words, they have these modern, you can actually solder bronze, you know, you heat it up with a, like a soldering tool. In, in, in the Greek era and also in the, in the Renaissance, what's amazing, they, they didn't have that capability. 
they had to, the, the, to hammer it, um, which is amazing when you think about it. That's why in that Greek calyx that, that I showed you, there were all those hammers all over the place because that was the only way to, to connect these things was to hammer it down. To complete the commission, the, the other question, the, the figures, it took me about uh, two, two months to complete the figures of each one. And um, I finished them in about October. And it's been since October that I've been working on the, the bronze casting process because there's three of them and it, it, takes, a, it takes a bit of, a bit of time. Okay, but before we go to another question, I'm just going to put in my um, weekly reminder uh, that we welcome everybody to these lectures, um, but we have to find a way for the Institute to keep going. Um, and so any donations people feel able to make are warmly and gratefully received at whatever level you're comfortable with. And Sarah will put up the link to the Just Giving page to help you to do that. So thank you in advance for any contributions you feel you can make. Um, Going back to questions of, um, from Nancy, while the ancient Greek bronze casting technique was lost in medieval Europe, were bronze sculptures being made in places like China and India? Was it happening yeah. elsewhere? Okay, th that, that's a really good question. If, if you look at um, Chinese art history, um, in fact, I, took a, uh, I, I studied with a, a Chinese uh, art historian, and if you look at Chinese art history, it's based on their bronze work. I mean, they were burying people uh, with these amazing bronze uh, bronze works. Um, and, and this is, you know, um, you know, this is you know, centuries ago. Um, what's interesting is that there might have been even some connection between China and and uh, um, uh, and Greece. In fact, they even think that the Qin warriors, those you know, all those uh, uh, terracotta warriors. Um, were even, uh, they even made some of them with the help of, of Greek artisans. So there's an interesting connection between uh, Chinese bronze casting and also, and also um, uh, a Greek uh, bronze casting, which I, I couldn't get into. But yeah, the, um, there's some major works in bronze in, the, in, the Chinese, uh, in Chinese history that were all buried and, and you find in museums today. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting, interesting aspect. Interesting aspect. And, and Isabella uh, notes that they were also doing bronze casting in Africa, the Benin oh, bronzes. Is Africa. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's, 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 it pops up in all sorts of different contexts how uh, different civilizations separated by vast geography, which they couldn't probably cover, were, were making similar discoveries and similar oh, innovations. Right, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Right. Interesting. No, uh, in, uh, people who are with us here on the Zoom, and we can see lots of happy faces, does anyone want to unmute and ask something? Please do. Yes, I'd, love to, I'd love to answer. I, uh, you have to can, is it me? Can you tell yes, me, is, on yes. finished bronze, there were little holes. It wasn't mm -hmm. the, the vents, but there were little round holes. What was that? Okay, those were, um, in certain cases, um, when you um, when you have the wax figure, right? Okay, and you and you put on those wax runners. When they eventually get melted, there's nothing that's holding the interior core. So what you have to do is you have to put in these these um, large nails. Yes. Okay. In order to fix it to the the exterior core. Now, what happens is, is that um, uh, when you when you cast everything, those those nails, which are they're a metal that that heats obviously that that fuses at a higher temperature, remain, and they are still in the sculpture in bronze. So you've got to cut those out. You have to get rid of that metal completely because it's it's not going to be the same uh, patina. So what they've done, what you have to do is you have to you have to drill them out, take them out, so that that other metal isn't in there anymore. In certain cases. Thank but you. Yeah, I know that's a, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, which local foundry did you use to uh, do it? Do perform the casting for you? Okay. The, the the one that I went to. That's a good question. I should have said this. Is um Chidia e Kazai, which is in Kashin del Riccio. Um, uh, uh, and, and ironically, uh, Chidia e Kazai had their bronze casting foundry about five doors down from my studio. I was right not in the center of Florence. They had to move it outside the city because things explode. Um, in this, in, around Florence, there's about four or five good bronze casters still around. There's a Del Giudice, um, Cipriani, 
Uh, there's one in, uh, uh, near uh, uh, Punta Pieve, and then there's Chile Cabral. There's also a few other ones. But Florence is still, people come from all over the world. Uh, where I'm working right now, they're doing uh, sculptures for New York, uh, um, uh, some Arab countries. Um, they work really well. The bronze casting foundries are never stopped work even through the um, even through the pandemic. So yeah, Chidia e Kazai, Chidia e Kazai. Thank you, um, Jennifer. Skeeping is asking, why did Pewter save the day for Cellini? Okay, <laughs> that guy, I didn't get into that. In fact, the other thing I didn't read is that even though he threw in that big sixty-pound chunk of pewter in the uh, in the in the bronze. It still wasn't flowing, and he had to. He yelled at all of his workers to go find all the pewter cups and plates and saucers that they found in all the houses they could find, and they threw it into the bronze mass. In fact, ironically, when they analyzed the Perseus when they restored it about 15, 20 years ago, it has a high content of pewter. So, 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 <laughs> please, um, uh, pewter is a metal that makes bronze flow more. Okay, it it doesn't interfere with the alloys of the of the copper and the tin putting it in, and this is really technical stuff that I'm not an expert in, but um, throwing it in, it heats it up quicker and also it, it makes it flow more. So uh, uh, that's why he kept, kept on adding a uh, pewter into it. They don't do that anymore. There's other substances they put into it, but the Perseus has a high content of pewter um, and they're probably all the cups and plates that he had in his, in his house <laughs> at that time period. So, so Cellini, though histrionic, was technically very uh, knowledgeable, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was really good. It was really good. Um, Michael Thompson Glover, Glover asked, was Toyajani using the same techniques? No? You know, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, um, essentially, the bronze casting technique, there, there are not a lot of variations. Um, uh, there are not a lot of variations. Um, I, I, I haven't done any research on that. But um, he probably used one of the other, the, um, the, the core with the wax skin and then finish it up, or the, um, the, casting, the casting process. I think in the Renaissance, they were, at that time, they uh, probably used both. Um, it depended on the work, um, if you wanted to risk it more. But again, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I have to, I have to look at a few questions. Okay. And for Rob, for Rob, from Robert Nyden, um, what, what is used to patinate the completed sculpture? Um, there's... Um, various substances that you can use with, with heat. Um, in fact, the, the, the name is, um, I think it's a sulfide. I forget what the, what the, the technical term is. Um, I mean, the, the patent, if you leave bronze, when it, when it casts and it comes out and you chase it up, it's golden. And then eventually it will begin to just oxidize by itself. Um, there's various substances you can put on it to make it look more golden or look more green or keep that, that bronze sort of uh, keep it um, uh, it, it, in fact, I forget the, the technical term. If he wants to write me back personally, he can. I'll get that. I'll get that back to you. It basically it's a substance you, you spread onto it, and then with the blowtorch you heat it, and essentially it begins to change color. And depending on how long you heat it, you can uh, um, uh, how do you say it? Um, determine what color you want. I want to keep these that nice brown, bronze, uh, that nice brown bronze color. Um, uh, please write me and I'll get that, I'll get that information for you. I just know that. Oh. Ben is asking for confirmation as to where your three bronzes are going. I think it's the Florida State campus, the new one here in, in Florence, isn't it? Exactly. It's uh, right in Via dei Neri. They have the Palazzo Bagnese. It's going into the ground floor. Um, thank goodness, because the carriages upstairs would be a little difficult. Um, the ground floor sort of atrium of the, of the school, of the school. So reason, reasonably accessible. Yes, exactly. They should be. Uh, they should be when everything clears up. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Oh, when they're all ready and that, and, and that would have to do a little guided visit to go and have a look at them. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do it. Definitely. Yeah. You, you guys have seen things that not no one else has seen. So this is a uh, this is a uh, um, ante prima. <laughs> and Barbara's put the uh, but, but Penny uh, straight, and it's um, Florida State University, not the University of Florida. Very, very right. different. Florida big State. rivals, big rivals at football and basketball and things. I'd imagine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Barbara was an FSU model angel. That's why she knows well, about these things. <laughs> you know, what? I just saw that, and I just, I, I, I completed a monument to the mud angels in December. That's already in the school, so she will definitely have to come back. Go talk, Penny. 
Um, so definitely have to come back because I, I did a full scale monument dedicated to those blood angels of S FSU. Um, so um, uh, definitely, you have to definitely come to, to, to Florence. I'm sure Barbara will be back just as soon as it's possible. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, Susan, Susan's asking about the risk of air bubbles exploding uh, when you put the wax onto the clay. Yeah, um, there's, yeah, there, there is. In fact, the, the, um, there's a couple of ways of doing it. You, you usually want to brush it on. That's the best way. Or what they actually do is it's called the shock wool. In other words, when they pour the, 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 the liquid wax in the mold and then they begin to move it around. So you get one layer, thin layer, and then another layer, and another layer. Um, there are going to be small air bubbles. It's also how hot the wax is and also the mixture of your wax because there's a wax for working in the winter and the wax for working in the summer. It's a mixture between beeswax and paraffin um, uh, that makes it a little hard. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a question of getting the right heat and also moving it around so that um, you do eventually fill up any air bubbles that, that do occur. Mm. A thought that's crossed my mind uh, is um, your, your lecture was absolutely fascinating because you were explaining how um, Cellini and others worked because you've been doing very similar things yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I know your art practice is um, very involved with um, using the traditional um, Renaissance techniques in your work. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of bronze sculptures of various um, merit being made around the world at the moment. Are, are there some completely different modern techniques which make it a lot easier or um, is everyone doing it in a similar sort of way? There, there are. Um... In fact, that's why I like Chile Casale because they, they still maintain that they're very uh, uh, um, uh, founded in tradition. If you go to Pietra Santa and, and if you go to where they make Botero's huge sculptures, um, uh, um, Marianne, I think it's, their name is, um, instead, of, instead of casing the whole work in, in those big, huge uh, sort of um, a gesso and earth sort of uh, uh, tubes, there's a, uh, it's called a refractorio. It's a refractive material. It's sort of like an, um, a fireproof foam that hardens and they spray it. And, and instead of massing this, you know, huge mound of, of, of plaster of Paris around it, it's this foam that actually adheres to the, to the, to the, the wax and all the runners. So it's, it's a lot lighter and also uh, it probably costs a little less and it's also a little bit easier, more it's easier to, to manage. So there are techniques. As far as the furnace is concerned, yeah, they're probably um, higher technology furnace. But what I liked about Chile Kadai is that they still maintain that absolute control of everything by using these old sort of um, old sort of techniques and not trusting. I mean, the modern things work, yes. Um, there's even ways of getting bronze a lot thinner. Um, but um, there's also um, uh, there's also other things that can go wrong. Uh, but yeah, there's some there's some other modern things um, uh, that you can use. Right. Okay. Um, look, anybody else on the Zoom wants to go live with a question? Um, yeah, I don't keep you too, too Be long. brave. I'm getting fed up with the sound of my own voice. <laughs> no, these are these are great questions. Yeah. I, I really, um, I thank you for all your questions. If you want to write me, definitely, I'd be happy to to, to respond um, eventually. Um, sure. Sure. If you haven't got Alan's um, email address, just send something to Sarah, and she'll forward it. Okay. Okay. Director at British Institute. IT. Um, okay. Any more for any more? Okay, I think we're coming towards the natural end. We've okay. quarter past the hour, so okay. that's all good. Uh, good luck with finishing the works, um, okay. and I look forward to seeing them in presence at the Palazzo when when the time is possible. Look forward okay. to seeing many of you back here in Florence when it's possible. And for okay. those who are in Florence, actually seeing you rather than just seeing you on the Zoom. But um, at the moment with Zona Rossa, we've got to be patient for a few more weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and anyhow, happy Easter, everybody. Um, have a great night tonight. Get a good yeah. break over the weekend. Um, and uh, see many of you next week, I hope, okay. um, for Thank Eddie Walker's talk on oh, Thanks again, Simon. Okay. I really appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Bye bye. Happy Easter. Bye bye. Have a good one. Ciao. 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 Ciao.